Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Rugby Canada webinar series presented by DHL. My name is Jackie Titley. Uh, I'm the Manager of Training and Education here at Rugby Canada. Happy to be here with you. Uh, today's subject is Activate, the World Rugby Injury Prevention uh, Resource uh, that was launched just uh, earlier this year. Uh, very excited to have Dr. Mike Heslop, who is a researcher with World Rugby and was at the forefront. Um, and heavily involved in the uh, development and, and distribution uh, of Activate. So we're very lucky, very happy uh, to have Mike here with us today. Thanks for being here, Mike. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Um, we also have uh, Nathan Abdelnour and Ashley Armstrong, who will be demoing uh, several of the exercises. Very exciting. Uh, some live demos um, so that as we go along the way and uh, Mike is explaining some of the uh, some of, of what the resource has to offer. You'll also have um, a live demonstration. So live very exciting in-home studio. <laughs> Set up and ready to go. Very uh, very exciting. Uh, so thanks for being with us, everyone. Uh, without further ado, I will uh, pass it over uh, to you, Mike. Give me one second. I'll make you a presenter, and away we go. Right. Can everybody just see it? The slides just appeared on there now, Jackie? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, and thanks very much for, for tuning in. It's it's great to be able to, to come online and, and share with you what's what's been a pretty long-winded project for me. We first um, we first started Activate back in, in 2013 in the UK, and then uh, uh, following the results that I'll go on to share with you, we um, we then with world rugby decided that it was something that we wanted to roll out globally in 2017 and over the course of that time um, we've been working away until we launched it in september last year and, and now it's great to, to kind of see it growing around the world um, and i'm excited to share with you some of the the insights i've gained from that process um, and, and really it's just hopefully been able to share some of that information and, and to make you all aware and, and hopefully a little bit more understanding around the program its its goals and and hopefully leaves you wanting to go and, and start using it with your your players once the um, restrictions start to ease and we can start to get some rugby back in again. So just to begin with, um, just a little bit of housekeeping from my perspective. There's a, a QR code I've just put onto the the slide there, and that will take you, if you scan that with your phone um, now, that will take you to the online content for Activate. Uh, I'll touch a little bit more uh, about that in due course, but on there, that's that's kind of become our one-stop shop. Uh, for activate resources so on there you'll find cue cards manuals videos and individual versions of the exercises and at the moment those are also available not just in in english but in french and spanish as well and there will be more languages down the line but i expect french and, and english would be the big two for you so um, please feel free just to, to grab a quick scan of that at the moment and then you can obviously follow that through um, while we're going through these slides over the the next couple of um, well next hour or so Mike, um, sorry yeah. to jump in there. Um, for the folks online, we also have a few of the manuals that are in the handout section um, of your uh, of your dashboard. So, folks, you can probably see the questions function where you can pose any questions throughout the webinar, clarifications or or otherwise, and we will have a Q and A uh, at the end. But there is also a handout section where you can download some of those PDFs uh, directly um, as well. Great, thank you. So in terms of what I'll be talking to you about and, and discussing with you over the next hour or so, there's there's a fair few things to get through, but really I just want to start by giving you a little bit of, of background to activate, particularly for the for those of you that might not have heard about this before or, or only know a few bits and pieces about it. So just to fill in, in some of the blanks. Um, and then we're going to move into really the bulk of it, which is talking about how to use activate with your players. It's it's a question I often get asked a lot by coaches is okay, this is this is great. I know the structure and I know what it's about, but I don't really know quite yet how this looks in, in my setting. Um, so I hope to give you some useful information and, and some tips and, and so on, just to, to hopefully start getting you thinking about how this might look in, in your setting as well. Um, as, as Jackie already mentioned, we've got Nathan and Ashley who have very kindly volunteered to, to go through a couple of practical examples of some of the exercises that, uh, that I'll talk them through. And then lastly, one of the things that it, we felt it would be quite useful to include was just talking about integrating activate into your return to play structure now that we are starting to see restrictions being eased um, around the world 
and obviously there is going to be a return to play structure for you and, and seeing how activate might look um, as you progress through those phases uh, as we hopefully get back towards normality as well so hopefully that sounds that sounds good to everybody really just the the first thing it's um i already touched on this was a project that started uh, a little while ago now back in the uk and, and just as an acknowledgement although world rugby is is implementing activate around the world um, the original project that developed and evaluated the program was was funded by England Rugby. Um, so it's just a case of, of giving a little bit of due acknowledgement to the individuals that I've listed down there who are instrumental in, in kind of helping out with developing and then uh, evaluating that program, which is where we are now, really. So the first question is, what is, what is Activate? And um, I've tried over the years to boil it down to something that I think is quite short, simple and, and user friendly. And, and this is really where I'm at at the moment. And in simple terms, Activate is, is a structured progressive set of exercises that are designed to be used as part of training sessions and pre-match warm-ups. Um, and although this was, was heavily dependent on, on scientific evidence, one of the things that I'm, I'm quite proud of and, and quite um, keen to express to people when I speak about it is that this wasn't just something that was the basis of scientific evidence and an expert opinion. We actually were heavily dependent on coaches involved in community youth and adult rugby um, and seeking their feedback from using the program in order to shape its structure and, and the content. And, and as I'll go on to talk about in, in the next couple of slides, a lot of that feedback was actually very instrumental in changing the program to something that into what it is today um, the first version of activate and now look, look very different and, and a big part of that is based on um, coaches using it and providing some feedback to us on on what was good and, and what needed to be changed so so this is what it looks like and this this would look like a, a typical session so in a given session there would be four parts a b c and d and as you'll notice there's there's two versions of, of activate there's a youth version and an adult version now not wanting to overcomplicate it, the youth version then divides again into three age groups that cover the 13 to 18 year old age range. And then the adult would be for, for individuals over 18. And really the, the key thing I'm just trying to, to get across here is that a lot of the, there's a lot of common themes across both versions of the program, but there are some minor differences. And, and really the first one to point out is around the youth. It, it's very much around developing physical qualities um, because in a lot of cases this is going to be the first exposure to structured conditioning work that many of these you know, young athletes might have had um, and so therefore they're starting from quite a low base um, so very much the aim of the program is to develop some of these physical qualities so resistant training for strength um, you've got plyometrics and some balance work there as well in terms of developing some power work but then there's also rehearsal of some sport specific um, activities like changing direction and landing which are pretty fundamental parts of a game like rugby the adult version is a little bit different um, and that's again based around the needs of the individuals and and you'll see there words like mobility and stability um, and i'm sure most of anyone that's played adult rugby generally finds that you know you, you fle you're most flexible and you're most mobile when you're younger and then it starts to deteriorate as you get a bit older um, and so really the key aim of, of the adult version of the program is to try and preserve the mobility and stability of the players across the season. Um, so the key thing is that in the youth version development, adult players preservation of function. And this is now what it looks like across a season, if you like. So as I said on the, the last slide, the youth version divides into three age groups. So you've got the under 15, under 16 and under 18. And you'll notice that there are four levels to each version of the program, and that's designed to be used over the course of the season. So you would start on level one, and then you would sequentially move through the levels. And as you do so, the exercises become a little bit more challenging. So the idea is that by becoming more challenging, you're starting to look at things like overload and the variation and progression as well to keep the players stimulated. Um, the other key thing to, to point out with the youth version there is that also as you look across, there's some continuity involved. So once you've moved through the under 15, version of the program and of course one season at the start of the next season you can then move to the under 16 and and so on so that offers a bit of continuity so you're not necessarily going to start at level one of the under 15 program move to level four and then start the next season back at level one again that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me so by doing that it offers some continuity as well but the structure doesn't really change so the players should be used to it 
Um, the other thing as well to point out is that if you, they're offset, so essentially here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but if I'm hovering over the level three of the under 15 version of the program, that's quite an advanced level for those players because they've not necessarily had much exposure, as I said earlier, to strength and conditioning. So they would work through levels one and two first, but that's very similar in its challenge to level two of the under 16 program and in turn level one of the under 18 program, because again, the under 18 players, some of them may have had four or five years exposure to strength and conditioning practices than a player age 13, for example. So if you were to give them a level one version of the program for the under 15s to an under 18 player, that's probably not going to be very stimulating. That's not going to promote any kind of, of change. So the idea is that those are also offering a slight age appropriateness as well, based on the needs of those individuals. So that hopefully gives you a little bit more clarity around the youth version of the program. The adult version of the program was, was developed in a slightly different setting. Um, the adult program was developed for the adult community game uh, in the UK, whereas the youth version was, was developed primarily for schools. Um, now, schools operate on a very, very short season in the UK, no more than about 12 or 14 weeks in length, hence why there's only about four levels. The adult version was developed for the club season, which is probably around about seven or eight months now, if you don't include the pre-season period. So in order to try and keep the same kind of level length or the same time that you would spend at each level, you then need to obviously have a greater number of levels to progress through. The other big difference, as you'll see on the slide, is that there's a little cell at the top there called match day. Now, one of the key pieces of feedback we got from adult community club coaches, and I'd, I'd be interested to know if this is the experience that any of the listeners have, have had as well, is that match day warm-ups tend to be quite sacred in that players don't really like to change them throughout the season. So they'll start with a certain structure earlier in the season, and that will stay the same all the way through. They don't like to, to necessarily change things up. And so we felt that it would be a good idea to include a specific match day level. So regardless of the time in the season, you would use that version of the program as part of your pre-match warm-up, and then you would progress through the seven levels um, during your training sessions, for example. Um, that wasn't necessarily the case in, in the youth version of the program, although any of you that have, have been through the program as of yet will notice there are probably a couple of exercises in there that you might do as part of your training session routine, but you wouldn't do as part of your pre-match warm-up routine because some of those activities can be quite fatiguing, for example. So you don't really want to be doing them as part of your pre-match warm-up, but during your training session, that shouldn't be a problem. Ultimately, though, this is why I'm, I'm speaking to you about this programme and, and why World Rugby have decided this is something that they want to be rolling out across the world. And it is the fact that there is a player welfare. Um, sorry, excuse me. That, that back. There is a player welfare benefit to it. And um, the main one being around soft tissue injuries and match injuries. Now, I won't bore you with the, the gory details around how we did the study. Um, but essentially what we did was we ran two studies. One was in the youth schools game, one was in the adult community game. And essentially we collected data from a cohort of schools and a cohort of clubs. And in the schools, we randomly allocated half of those teams to use the Activate program. And the other half were given a, a standard of practice warm up program. And the same for the adults as well. And then we collected injury data throughout the playing season as coaches were using the program with their players. And then that's ultimately what we're comparing against here. So in this figure, you've got the youth version on the left-hand side, adult version on the right. And then on that y-axis, you've got the change in injury risk. Now, if you see where the, the x-axis is, that's at 0%, which would suggest that there's no difference in injury rates between these two groups, the ones using Activate and the ones using the control program. If the bars are coming down, that would suggest that there are fewer injuries using Activate, which is what we want, that's beneficial. And if the bars were going upwards, that would suggest that they're actually getting more injuries using Activate, i.e. that using Activate was harmful. Now, fortunately, what we can see is all of the bars are coming down. So it does suggest that there is a benefit to using Activate, uh, and that's to varying degrees. Now, the solid black bars there uh, represent overall match injuries. So any injury that was sustained by players during schools or club matches, and then were reported to medical staff at the school or club respectively, were then recorded. And what you can see is that those, those bars are coming down by about 15 to 20%. So we can see that there's about 15 to 20% fewer match injuries overall, which it's probably not that surprising given the nature of rugby and the nature of the injuries that we see. And also that we know that generally programs like Activate, and there are a number of examples, anyone that's been involved in soccer might know about the FIFA 11 plus 
for example. But one of the things we know is that programs like this aren't generally going to help with certain injury types. So bone fractures would be an obvious one. It's not going to necessarily have much of a benefit on those. Where we do tend to see benefit is in our soft tissue injury reduction. And so particularly muscle, tendon, ligament injuries uh, are a key one. And, and actually in rugby, those injuries make up probably two thirds to three quarters of the injuries that we see across the game. Uh, and what we can see there is that actually now there's a little bit more benefit. So we're actually now seeing 26 to 40% fewer soft tissue injuries. And then lastly, the, the, the black bar with the, the white spots in it is, is concussion. And this was one that was um, incredibly encouraging for us, but a little bit surprising, if I'm being honest. Um, and what we actually saw was that teams using Activate were suffering 29 to 60% fewer concussions. Um, now, I know that there's a pretty big discrepancy there between the two. And, and without wanting to get too technical, it's probably just worth me clarifying why. In the, the youth study, we collected injuries that only resulted in a player being out of play for 24 hours, um, typically with players in schools coaches will have a fairly intensive working relationship with those players so they're going to see them day in day out so when a player misses a day it allows them that sensitivity to capture that injury whereas in the club game generally players might not turn up to training for a number of reasons during the week they might not then be seen again until the next match so you're likely to miss some injuries and so in the adult study injuries that ruled a player out for a week or longer were recorded so there's a slight definition difference between the two studies which may explain some of the discrepancy um, so I'm sure that might be a question that will come along at some point. So I thought I would just clarify that. So injury prevention, we know, is, is one of the benefits of using Activate. I'm, I'm quite keen to stress that I don't think it's the only benefit. And, and one of the things that I'm, I'm very keen to stress is that I think Activate is just an example of good practice. Um, in the injury prevention is just not, not the component, it's a component of it. And I think that there's an athletic development benefit that comes from using the program as well, because if you look at a number of the exercises, and I'll give you some examples shortly, you're going to see a lot of similarity. So what you see in a program like Activate wouldn't look out of place in uh, an anatomic adaptation version of a program or um, an athletic development program if you're working with younger athletes. A lot of the exercises are gonna have those benefits across both. And then on top of that, if you're getting hopefully a reduction in your injury risk and you're seeing the players develop physically, that might actually lead to a little bit of success and enjoyment because the players are missing less time out of not just rugby, but other sports that they could be involved in. Um, and therefore, then if you've got your players to, you know, you've got all the players to select from, that's going to help you from being successful in terms of keeping players engaged in, in rugby as well. Because one of the things we do know is that injury and perception of risk can be um, a putting off factor in terms of whether players want to play rugby. So I think the benefits of using a program like Activate don't just start and end with injury prevention. I think it's an important part, but I think there's a bit more all encompassing um, or a number of other all encompassing features. Um, the other thing I, I always say with injury prevention is that generally speaking, injury prevention isn't seen as being important until you've suffered injuries. So, um, you know, I think that's a little bit of human nature really is that you don't tend to think of injury prevention as being important until you've had three or four injuries in a very short space of time in your playing squad that's now limited your ability to select your strongest team and in, in some cases maybe even limits your ability to put out a team full stop. Um, whereas I think it would be great if we could start to move that beforehand and say, well, let's take a more proactive approach to this as well. And then so we move on to the next part now, which is about actually how we use Activate with my players. Hopefully I've, I've pitched it to you that it's, it's a great program and, and everything's good. But now we've got to get into actually how do we use this? How does this look in, in your setting? And the reality is that there is no single way to use a program like Activate. Um, and I don't think that should ever be the case. I think as long as you set some base parameters, such as making sure that it's fun, it's purposeful and it's safe for players to complete, I think there's a lot of flexibility that you can introduce and a reinvention and reinvigoration so that it doesn't become stale and monotonous. And I'll give you some examples of that a little bit later on. Just a couple of bits and pieces around some of the basics. This might look familiar to some of you that have looked through the manual before, but just in terms of the setup, um, when, how long and where. In terms of when, it could be used as part of a training, pre-training warm-up routine, but you could also introduce it during the training session as well. And one of the things we find out is that, particularly when time is a barrier, for instance, if you only see your players for an hour at a time, spending 
20 minutes, half an hour on doing something like Activate, that's not a best. That's not the best use of your time necessarily. So putting that into an entire block as part of your training session probably isn't going to work very well. Whereas introducing it into parts of your training session, and I'll give you again some examples of that, might actually be a little bit more palatable. Um, and that goes for your training. In terms of your pre-match warm-up, you're a little bit more limited. It's it's going to be in the warm-up phase, for example. So it could be the first team-based activity. Um, once the players, once you've started the kind of process of getting ready for the game, it could be the first team-based activity. In terms of how long it should take, um, that 15 to 20, 20 to 25 minutes, that would be if you're using it as an entire block. So if you were to go through start to finish of the program, that's roughly how long it should take. Um, it's a little bit longer for the adults because there are a couple of other exercises in there as well. In terms of where, um, primarily natural or artificial art turf surfaces outdoors is great but i gather over in canada you, you get some pretty severe winters more so than, than we get over here in ireland so you are going to probably spend a fair bit more time earlier in the season indoors but there's no reason why you couldn't use activate an, on an indoor non-slippery surface like a sports hall for example what's needed again given the the current situation um, with covid and, and the fact that it's, equipment is going to be restricted for the time being that shouldn't be an offsetting factor. You, you don't really need much equipment to deliver Activate in its fundamental sense. You just need some cones to mark out the area as I, I showed you on the figure um, a minute ago. You can introduce other equipment, so things like rugby balls and so on, um, but I would just say to use your discretion a little bit with that. Um, if the introduction of those pieces of equipment makes the exercises more purposeful and fun for the players, then I think it's absolutely fine, but we've got to retain the, the fundamental essence of why we're doing it. And that is to make sure that we are developing the physical qualities in those players as well. And then in terms of the resources, I touched on that a moment uh, at the start of the, the webinar, which are the cue cards, the manual and the exercises. And again, I'll, I'll just go back and, and mention what Jackie said earlier, that in the handout section on, on the webinar, there are the, the English versions of those cue cards and, and manuals as well. In terms of progression, you'll remember a little while ago, I, I mentioned around that there are several levels to progress through as the season goes on. Um, ideally, players should start using the program in the pre-season period and then they would work through from start to finish. That's in an ideal world, not necessarily going to be the case. And so but players could pick up the program at a later stage in the season. Um, if that is the case, though, you should still begin on level one. So, for example, if you are two of the thirds of the way through the season and you want to start using Activate, you wouldn't start on level three. You would start on level one and just work through to the end of the season accordingly. And then as a rule of thumb, um, it may differ in some cases, but as a rule of thumb, we generally think you need about six to eight weeks for each level to develop the necessary control balance and technique in those exercises. Um, obviously, if you're getting two or three exposures a week to rugby, that could be as little as 12 sessions using those exercises. It could be as many as 24 sessions of using those exercises. So there's a good amount of time in there that you can get exposure to those exercises and it shouldn't become stale to the players. Um, in terms of, of coaching, um, this is me probably being a little bit more realistic and saying, look, I'd, I'd love to say it would take the same amount of time every time to use the program, but it won't. And certainly if you're beginning the program for the first time or a new level, um, and it'd be interesting if any of the listeners have used this before and, and if this tallies with their experience, but you'll want to dedicate a little bit more time than usual for that first session, because essentially this is going to be new for you and it's going to be new for the players. And so in order to get their understanding and hopefully a little bit of buy-in, it's worth dedicating a little bit more time than you usually would. And, and you can use that time um, to explain the purpose of each part of the program, because players may be curious or even skeptical in some sense why they're doing this. So being able to give them the answers is, is important. Demonstrating correct technique to the whole squad, um, and this really ties in now with, with the coaching process. So you would sort of tell, demonstrate, and then observe and, and feedback. And then following that, you would then allow the players to have a go at the exercises in pairs or small groups. Now, again, some of those exercises at the moment, given that we're in a, a still got some restrictions going on, there's going to have to be some, some management of that process. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And then the emphasis points that I, I think you should have is around the cue points. And we'll talk a little bit about the cues in a minute. But in terms of the, the key cues to elicit the movement that you want to see, I, I think it's better to, to go with a less is more approach. Um, so picking two or three key cues and then relating those to the exercise. 
prioritizing quality over quantity um that's a, a given given what we're trying to to demonstrate here which is the control balance and technique if a player can only do five repetitions out of eight with good quality it's better that they do five with quality than, than try and do eight and, and only get halfway there the benefit will be better with the first approach particularly if you're if you're working with older adolescent players and adults i think a good option is to actually use them to try and coach each other if they're working in pairs or small groups particularly if you're going to be in a, in a situation where there's maybe only one you and, and another coach and you've got 30 or 40 players at your disposal you you can't look everywhere at once to see what everyone's doing so being able to to delegate some of that responsibility to players if you can trust them that's a pretty useful strategy as well and then finally just around some feedback um again look this this won't sound alien to i'm sure to any of you that have been coaching providing constructive feedback to correct technique if required and then ultimately also if you're seeing players that are doing the exercises well then i think offering a little bit of public praise there can also be beneficial to them a little bit around and queuing now and i've just spoken about queuing in in the last slide um again it comes back to what we're trying to get out of the program here which is control balance and technique and that's going to come from the exercises being done with the necessary levels of those things and so sometimes you're going to find that that's not necessarily there that the players may struggle with the exercises um, they may struggle to either understand or even just to to execute them and so your ability to be able to cue what you want to see is is important and you need to be able to cue it in a way that's relevant and it actually also resonates with the players as well so they understand and and so one of the things I'm quite keen to stress is just around thinking around how you can cue that well. Um, and so I've got some examples there. Now, some of you will be familiar with the Activate 8 cues. If you're not, don't panic. I'll, I'll talk about them in the next slide. But the Activate 8 cues are, are essentially internal cues because they deal with what the body is doing. So I've given you a couple of examples there. Um, hips and shoulders level. You'll see an example of that here shortly. But thinking around that, a player may not necessarily have the ability to correct that. So you've got to think about how you can start to to provide the stimulus that they would then understand and be able to correct themselves so for instance you might look at an external cue or an analogy and in this case it might be imagine you're crawling through a narrow tunnel so they can't go up so they've got to stay at the same height all the way through another piece of feedback might be actually if the hips and shoulders are level if you place a ball in the lower back if the hips and shoulders are level the ball shouldn't move obviously if the hips are higher than the shoulders the ball's going to roll forwards if the whole shoulders are higher than the hips the ball's going to roll backwards so that's a useful little piece of feedback the other one then is soft knees which particularly applies towards some of our landing exercises and again soft knees that might not resonate very much with a player um, so thinking about how we can start to to change that might be using an analogy like land like a ninja and again it's quite funny sometimes we we do this activity as part of our quaint exercises and, and i will say land like a ninja and automatically people will clue into exactly what's being asked of them, i.e. to land silently without making a sound. Um, and ultimately then that starts to cue in what we want to see, which is they're not landing straight leg, they're landing with a slight bend in the knees um, and they're landing squarely on the feet as well. Another exercise might be using a player to try and listen out for sounds when those players are landing as well. So again, a little piece of feedback there. And I've just touched on, but these are the key activate eight cues. Now, essentially what we felt was that across all of the exercises in activate they boil down to around these four or these eight kind of um common cues or common things you want to be looking out for when you're coaching and observing your players because they're going to be things that a that's where we get the benefit and b that's generally where players tend to suffer a little bit with their their posture and so the first one is around our head neutral and our head lift positions now again those are some of the, the common poses that you'll see with those the head lift one um again that's going to apply more in, in prone positions but the cue i might give for something like that would be looking over the rim of your sunglasses so in that position there um, the player's got a pair of sunglasses on but they're looking forwards over the top of those sunglasses that might be a useful kind of cue for them there the next one around our, our chest and our torso area um, chest up and pinch the shoulder blades together they're quite complementary because if you pinch the shoulder blades together the chest should um, start to raise up as well then we've also got some of the exercises focusing around the trunk area so again I've, I've already mentioned shoulders level with hips and then on top of that also bracing through the trunk now particularly in set piece events like the scrum but also in breakdown situations and also the tackle being nice and, and rigid and strong through that trunk area is actually going to be really important um, in terms of affecting a good tackle or a good clear out or even being safer scrum with the engagement 
So being able to brace through the trunk and maintain rigidity there is actually quite a key thing to have. And so it's a good thing to develop throughout the program. And the last three there are around our lower limb alignment. Now, again, programs like Activate, particularly lower limb injury prevention is, is a key motivating factor for these. And particularly in our alignment from our lower limb um, and in our hip, knee and ankle, particularly our knees in particular, because we want to see our knee in line with our hip and ankle, because if, they, if the knee is bending inwards or buckling outwards, that can actually put it in an at-risk position, particularly for some of those nasty injuries like cruciate ligament injuries that we see, um, not just in rugby, but in, in other sports like soccer as well. And then we've already touched on soft knees and the last one being knees over toes, which we primarily use with some of our lunge patterns that are quite frequent in, in the youth version of the program in particular. So this is now the bit where I've got my two glamorous assistants, Nathan and Ashley. Mike, before you yeah. move to some of the demos, we did have a clarification question about the length of time sure. um, of each hmm. level. And so um, the question was really, is the program the same if you have, you know, one one session a week versus three? So could you put, uh, would it be possible to, to, I guess, narrow it down by number of sessions versus number of weeks? It's entirely possible. Um, I mean, it's, it's, I think there's a question of flexibility more so than anything. So if you feel that if you have two sessions that are two hours long, then potentially you've got enough time to be able to run the entirety of the program. Whereas if you've only got an hour, there's an option then to also start pushing parts of it into certain parts of the session. And also, for example, another thing that you could do is if you've got a session that you know is going to be quite contact orientated, so particularly around breakdown or, or tackle work, you might focus on a certain part of the program, like part C, which is the body and targeted resistance work. Whereas if it's more non-contact and um, team run throughs, for example, you might focus a little bit more on the balance and, and some of the landing and change of direction work. So, yeah, absolutely. Based on the number of sessions, if it's around how much time you reasonably can give towards doing these exercises as well. And I, I'm of the opinion that doing something is better than nothing. Mm. So, yeah, absolutely. I think there's there's a lot of flexibility that can go in there. OK, thank you. Perfect. So, Nathan and Ashley, can you hear me? You bet. Perfect. So we've got five activities. I'm just going to take you through. The first one is a single leg balance. And again, just for the, the listeners, I have added that QR code from the start of the, the, um, the slides again. So if just if you want to go through and have a look, I've included the reference to those activities um, just next to them in the brackets. So if you want to go through and see what the exercises also look like through there, please feel free. So Nathan, actually, the first exercise I'm going to have you do is, is a single leg balance. Now, balance work, if you think about how much time you spend on one leg in a game of rugby when you're landing and changing direction, having good control through your lower limb is actually really important. And that's one of the reasons why we're going to be doing this exercise. So first and foremost, can I just get you to have stand feet a little bit narrower than shoulder width apart? Perfect. OK, just head up looking at the camera for me or actually just looking straight ahead. If you could, please hands down by your sides. Now, I just want you to slowly raise one foot off the floor and just curl it behind your knee like so. OK. So there we go. Slight bend in your standing leg. Perfect. OK. And we're nice and rigid through our trunk, head neutral, and we've got our hip, knee and ankle in line as well, which looks good to me. So we're going to hold that for a few seconds and then we're going to change legs. OK, so once you slowly lower that raise leg down and then you're going to alternate onto that leg now. Good stuff. Remember, head up looking forwards for me. Great. OK. So the next one then is our zombie squat. So let's think of an analogy for this. So how does how does a mummy walk? This is we call it a zombie squat, but it really should be a mummy squat. So how does a mummy walk exactly? So we've got our hands out in front at shoulder height. OK, like so feet a little bit wider than shoulder width apart. And I want you to slowly squat down by bending at your hips and your knees, trying to keep your chest up for me. So keep your chest pointing towards the sky and you're going to lower yourself down until your thighs break parallel with the floor. Keep going, keep going. Very good. And then slowly back up to the start position again. Try and keep our knees over our toes as well. One more for me. Again, head up looking forwards. Good stuff. OK. The next one we're going to do then is our static neck contraction. So first things first, head in neutral for me. OK. And then I want you to place both your palms onto your forehead like so. OK, and I want you to while keeping your head still, I want you to try and push your head backwards. So your eyes are looking to the sky. OK, but you're going to resist. So your head shouldn't move at all. So you want to be pushing just enough force through that it's taxing um, 
to hold in that position. OK, a couple more seconds. Very good. This time now hands behind your head and you're going to try and push your chin to your chest for me. OK, same thing again, though. Resist, resist, resist. Two, one. OK, this time left hand to the left side of your head and you're going to try and push your right ear to your shoulder. Very good. And then to the other side now. So this time it's going to be your right hand on the right side of your head to try and push your left ear to your left shoulder. OK, and then last two, this time left hand on your temple. OK, on your left temple. And you're going to try and now turn your head to look over your right shoulder. Very good. Remember, have that head in neutral looking forwards for me, please. Good. And then last time. Right hand, right side of your head to try and turn your head to look over your left shoulder. Very good. Well done. OK, last couple. This one is, is from our adult version of the program. This is a squat stand. So again, feet a little bit wider than shoulder width apart for me. OK, and I'd like you to squat down and cup your fingers underneath your toes. OK, very good. You can have your hands inside your elbow. Very good. <laughs> so mobility one this is and then slowly i want you to stand up so you're going to extend your knees and your hips keep your two keeping your hands underneath your toes if you can okay slowly extend up once you get to the point where you can't keep your hand underneath your toes anymore stop and then you're going to squat back down again for me okay back to that start position and then extend up again until you can't go any further and then back down try and keep our head up as well looking over the rim of those sunglasses good stuff Fantastic. And then last one for me is a pop press up. OK, so can I have you just in a starting press up position for me? Thank you. That's great. So in a press up position for me and I want you to start with your hands quite narrow. OK, so your hands quite close together underneath your chest. Good stuff. So remember that head lift. So looking over the rim of our sunglasses as well. Good hips and shoulders level. And what I want you to do is you're going to push yourself away from the ground and you're going to catch yourself with your hands wider. So you're going to go from a narrow to a wide position. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so we'll have a quick look at that and see what that looks like. So push yourself away, push off and catch oh. it. There we go, Nathan, good stuff. There we go. And catch yourself, good soft elbows. And then we're going to, re put, we're going to repeat that, but this time we're going to go from wide to narrow. So we're going to start in a wide position, push yourself away explosively from the ground, Catch yourself with your hands close together under your chest. Very good. Remember looking over the rim of those sunglasses? Good. Um, one more. One more? What happened to one more? One more, one more, just one more. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, that's that's brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Nathan and, and Ashley. That's great. Feel free to no, sorry, Ashley. I'd be, I'd be doing those ones for my knees, so don't worry about it. Yeah. I was like, oh, <laughs> On the plus side, now you're bulletproof, so that's absolutely fine. <laughs> so hopefully that's just given you an idea then of some of the activities involved within the program. Um, and so now I'm going to talk to you a little bit around some of the delivery. And, and so my, my thinking on this is, has evolved a little bit over the last 18 months or so. Um, when we first designed the program, we looked at a very structured delivery model. Um, and I've given you some examples of, of or well, the characteristics of, of that structured delivery in that the program was isolated from the main body of the training session. The key focus was on deliberate practice, and that was key to, to gain understanding amongst the players of what we're asking them to do as coaches. It's likely to give the best results if it's adhered to. Um, and it's probably going to be a slightly more friendly option if you're inexperienced or, or you're unconfident in your ability to lead the program. And also, if you're dealing with a large player to coach ratio, because, again, I, I mentioned it earlier, if you're one coach or two coaches and you've got potentially 20 or 30, maybe 40 players at your disposal, you're going to have a very hard job being able to see what they're doing all the time. Whereas if you're delivering it in a very structured way, that's going to give you a better chance of being able to observe what the players are doing and then feedback and, and potentially correct as appropriate. But then I thought, well, that, that's kind of one end of a spectrum. And then there is an entire other end of the spectrum which I, I've termed a chaotic delivery model and and that for me I think is is almost the complete opposite of 
of the structured one. So whereas before we were looking at the session being isolated from the main body of, of training, I think now that in a chaotic model, you can actually fully immerse a lot of the exercises within the training session. And that could be using things like mini competitions between players, pairs and small groups. It could also be done as, as part of breakout sessions. So if you're doing a, let's say a school sided game, for example, and you say, right, okay, we play the game for two minutes. Now for 30 seconds, we're gonna do a couple of exercises from Activate and then we're back into the game again. And again, that, that helps keep things fresh for the players, keeps them stimulated, but also it could also be used as a means of active recovery. So if you're bring a huddle in of players during a session to explain to them, you know, how they think it's going, what changes do we need to make? You could also use that as an opportunity to use some of the exercises. So you could say, well, okay, 30 seconds and we're back into the game. I want you to do your single leg balance and then we're going back into it again. So you could also use it as a means of minimizing dead time. Inclusion of other equipment, I've already touched on it, providing that it maintains the purpose and the fun and, and the safety elements, then I think you can look at being quite creative with the equipment that you might have at your disposal. It's probably gonna be something that an experienced or a confident coach is gonna be able to, to handle um, in terms of, you know what the program is back to front and, and they know what to look for amongst their players. And then also it's probably gonna be beneficial from a low player to coach ratio as well, because again, having a low paired player to coach ratio means that you can also still maintain some degree of control when you're observing and, and correcting players. So that's kind of, of how I, I, I see it. And you've got the two extremes and then you've got everything in the middle of that. That could be what it looks like when you apply it to a level of Activate. So again, as I said, you've got the six to eight week window for level one, for example. You may well start very early with that using a structured delivery model, because again, it might well be new to you and the players. So actually taking that time to start to, to integrate the program and, and get the understanding and, and build the understanding amongst your players it is going to be a better approach and then over the course of that period of time as the players become used to the exercises because you have to remember that across this level the exercises don't change they don't change until level two so actually you can progress through from week one to week eight towards a potentially a chaotic delivery model so that by you the time you get to the the last week you've actually managed to move from an isolated training session into the full immersion um, and then also I think the benefit from that approach is that it helps to keep things fresh for the players as you keep changing up the delivery. Because if you were to keep doing the same kind of structure from week to week to week, I, I'm, I, I would find that quite monotonous as a player. Um, so being able to, to keep things fresh, I think is actually really important for a program like this to, to work. That's quite a linear way of looking at it though. And, and that's probably a little bit idealistic because the reality is that that progression from week one to week eight could look very, very different for each of you. You could start with a very structured model. And then by week eight, you're you're kind of using almost a fully chaotic model of delivery. And then you've built that across the course of the weeks. But actually, you might find that it takes the players quite a long time to, to nail this. And so you might find that you're sticking with a structured delivery model for maybe five or six weeks before you could start to, to offer some modifications. Alternatively, the players could get the hang of this very, very quickly. And so you can actually move from a very structured model to a chaotic model quite quickly. Um, so maybe within three or four weeks, you're almost operating on a, a fully chaotic delivery. Um, but even then, it might be the case that you, you move between the two. So you start in a very structured way. You start just to offer some experimentation. So you start looking at the modifications there, but you don't think the players are quite grasping what you're after. So then you move back towards a structured delivery and then you might move back towards a slightly chaotic delivery again. So the the point I'm trying to make is that really the situation can depend, but it's not necessarily a bad thing if you're moving from one approach to the other. That's actually quite good in my mind. Mike, you, you've and talked a little bit be... about, um, sorry to jump in, you've talked a That's little okay. bit about modifications here. And um, mm. we we had a good question uh, just after our, our wonderful demonstrations. Uh, thanks, Nathan and Ashley. Um, about uh, modifying certain activities uh, for players based on their skill level. We know as, as coaches, we have to do this on uh, with, with many, many different skills because we often have large groups of players with uh, a range of skills and abilities. Um, mm. So for example, the, uh, the push press from wide to narrow, let's say you had some players with a less developed upper body, you know, are, are there are there other exercises? You know, that one you can say a player could do it from their knees, for example. Um, are exactly. there examples of 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 uh, modifications to activities? 
Absolutely, yeah. And and the easiest one is to look at the different levels. So level one is generally the most the most basic level, particularly for mm-hmm. the younger athletes. So what you might find is that for some of the exercises, as you move through, because this progression it's based on a majority rules really, because what you'll find is that as you've highlighted, when you've got a large number of players, you'll probably have the majority that get the hang of it, some that get the hang very early, and then some that, that will still struggle. So even though you're going to move through from level one to level two, you might you might use the level one exercise with a small number of those players that still haven't quite grasped it. And, and the good thing is a lot of the exercises, they are linked in a certain way. So, for example, the single leg balance um, is the level one. And then you might progress that to a single leg balance with the eyes closed. And then the next exercise may well be a partner single leg balance where the partner is trying to push their their, their partner off balance as well. So there is a possibility that you can also still move back to another level if you feel that certain players aren't getting the hang of it. So absolutely, yeah, there are there are modifications that you could make and, and regressions. Wonderful. Thanks. No problem at all. So just now, if we look at this across the course of, of a season now, for example, um, a couple of guiding points there. I think the key thing is, is thinking very carefully about when to progress along that continuum. Um, just because you've done one approach one week it doesn't mean to say that it's going to work again in three or four weeks time. Um, you know, being the best approach sometimes is a little bit context specific. One of the things I do find in, in my experience is that generally people do progress too far or too fast. Um, and sometimes they feel that they just have to keep going. So they keep progressing too far or too fast. Now, the issue is once you get to level four, there isn't really another level beyond that. So if you get to, to level four in, in six weeks, for example, you then may well potentially have another two months of using those same exercises. So it is okay to revisit an earlier approach. I I, I certainly think we've got to look beyond this kind of linear progression thing. And I think we can look at more non-linearly. And then as an example of that, I think variation and reinvention can also be as useful at all as progression. So thinking about different ways of delivering the exercises, whether it could be gamified. So you've just seen, for example, there, um, what other exercises do we have there? So you have things like zombie squats. So for example, you could use zombie squats as a form of a game amongst players, so as a competition. Um, single leg balance, as I said there, you might use that as a mini competition between players as well, um, particularly if you're offering some kind of, of competition where they have to manipulate each other out of position. Um, the key thing I, I would say though, is that it's, it, it, there is a trial and error to this um, to find out what will work and what won't. And, and that's no different to many other examples in coaching that you'll find. You'll see something that you want to try and you'll say, OK, I want to have a go at this with my players. And, and it doesn't quite come off. That doesn't mean it's a bad approach or a bad activity. It just means that it's not the right time to do it. And so that might go back in the toolbox and then it will come out again at the, another time. Um, and so there is a degree of trying to find the approaches that work best for you in your situation. And again, that's why it comes back to this. This one size doesn't fit all approach to a program like this. But what I do think is important is just around some of the fundamental guidelines. And and as long as the exercises are completed with control, balance and technique in a way that's fun, purposeful and safe, I think that's quite a good boundary to operate within in terms of it gives you the flexibility, but also means that you're not necessarily going to be going off reservation. So we're almost into the the final straight now. And and the last thing I want to talk about a little bit is just around integrating Activate into your return to play structure. And what I've used here are the five phases um to go through uh, in terms of easing of restrictions and at the top of this i've added certain features of that phase so for example distancing permitted equipment permitted activities and and player engagement and then below that i've offered some kind of possible thoughts around how activate might look in uh, in that setting and so really the when we start with phase one phase one at the moment is is the most restrictive of the five phases as you might expect you've got to maintain a minimum of two meters all the time Um, There's no shared equipment, non-contact activities, uh, and those activities must be individual in terms of how we're engaging with the players. So if we think about how that applies to Activate, well, the priority aim, if this is going to be the first time you're using the program, is it's going to be introducing you and players to the program and embedding it into the coaching practice. Um, I've already touched on the fact it doesn't really need any equipment and certainly none that needs to be in contact with the players. So you could just get away with using some cones. You're obviously not going to be able to use any paired activities, and there are some, but primarily across level one of Activate, you'll find that a lot of the activities are are, are players individual. They're doing individual things. But there are some options. So, for example, you could use things like team relays if you're using some of the activities that are running based. You could also look potentially at salt course type things as well. So you could look at a combination of those two things. 
um, in order to try and keep things interesting for the players. As I said before, though, thinking about what the key aim here is, you're probably going to be leaning more towards a structured delivery model to start with before you start to, to look at some of those, um, those kind of modifications or gamifications. We then move into to phase two of the return to play structure. And the key change here is that now there's we can start to introduce a little bit of ball work. So there's a shared ball between small groups of players, I think five to 10 people at the moment, but still non-contact activities. And so how does that, that fit in with Activate at the moment? Or how does Activate fit in with that? Again, we're still probably gonna be continuing the familiarization. There are still gonna be some cases where the players aren't quite sure on certain exercises. But what it does mean is that you can start to trial some modifications of some of those exercises. So for example, with a shared ball, you might actually then start to use some paired activities, um, such as the balance activities without contact. So again, you could have some single leg balance involving some passing work, for example. And again, you might look at some of those team relays and assault courses, but then you could also start to introduce some of those mini competitions for some of those paired activities, particularly the balance ones, because at the moment they are non-contact. Phases three and four, so we're starting to see a little bit more now in terms of the, the restrictions being eased. So now you can have limited breaches of the two meter um, distancing. So you can start to introduce a little bit more close contact work. The shared balls, flags and strength and conditioning equipment. And again, that can start to be an option for you to use as part of you know, using Activate. And then we can start to use some rugby training and small sided games as well um, in the training group that you have. And again, you can start to look at expanding those modifications in the delivery types. Um, you're probably going to find as well, though, that around this time, you're going to be looking at considering progressing to the next level. Um, in terms of equipment, again, introducing, you can use those pieces of equipment, but it comes back to a, a decision on your part as the coach as to whether or not they're actually going to add anything or take away from what you're trying to do with the exercises. You can also start to introduce some of the paired exercises that involve limited contact. Um, and again, you might now start looking at those exercises as breakouts and skill zones and active recovery. So if you are using quite a lot of small sided games, you could use the exercises from Activate as part of those kind of breakouts and, and, and active recovery pieces as well. And again, that can stay the same across phases three and four. Um, the big difference here is that with phase three, you can start to introduce some paired exercises. With phase four, you can start to expand on the number of paired exercises that are going on. And again, that might offer you some additional avenues to explore with regards to modifications to some of those existing exercises. And then lastly, we're into to phase five, which essentially means there's, there's no more restrictions in place um, other than in terms of full contact games, you would have a minimum period of a couple of weeks um, of full contact training. And again, this is now really where all bets are off, um, providing that you stay within those kind of key, those key parameters of, of control balance technique and, and fun, purposeful and safe. Um, there's no restriction on paired activities. And again, you could progress now fully along the continuum from a structure to, to a chaotic delivery type. Um, it really could be up to you. So I think that's just a couple of summary messages from me now um, that I just kind of want to leave you with. Um, the first one really, as I said before, activate. I, I really, I'm keen to get to the stage where it's just seen as good practice, not just as an injury prevention program, because as I said, the benefits far, exceed just injury prevention as important as that is there's a number of other benefits that can come from using a program like this um, the key thing is to try and minimize the gaps between the program and, and your coaching practice which as i've said is, is different for everybody but if you can try to minimize the distance between what the program currently looks like and your coaching practice by changing the structure of the program um, that's going to hopefully make life a lot easier in terms of being able to deliver this as part of your coaching environment allied to that there's there's no one size fits all to this um, and again I, I can't say that enough there's not always going to just be one way of delivering this and certainly not between you but also across a playing season how you deliver the program can differ as well and as I said before as long as you set yourself some some guidelines around what you're trying to get out of it um, i.e developing control balance and technique retaining the fun purpose and, and the safety there's a hell of a lot that you can do to modify this so I think that's kind of my, my key concluding messages. If we've got any questions, I'm uh, more than happy to, to, to answer them. Thanks, Mike. Um, that was wonderful, very informative. Um, thank you for adding those uh, modifications and, the, and that alignment to Rugby Canada's return to play phases. I, I think that will be particularly helpful um, for the coaches online. We do have a few questions. so. 
uh, I'll, I'll get to uh, the first couple that have come through. And folks, if you have other questions, we do have a few uh, minutes to spare here. So um, please ask your questions, any clarifying or, or additional information that you might be looking for. Um, so we do have a, a question here, Mike. Um, you had mentioned that the school seasons are, are short in um, <laughs> in the UK. They are uh, uh, high school seasons, especially, are quite short here. University, uh, depending on what area of the country you're in, can be quite short as well. <laughs> um, we might only be looking at about 12 to 14 weeks. So would you expect um, that those programs may only make it through phases uh, or levels one and two uh, of the Activate program, or, or you know? If it's an experienced group of athletes, would you start them in level three the following year? How do you how how do you see that rolling out? Well, when we ran it as as part of the UK schools, actually the progression link was about four weeks. Um, so in fairness, you could probably get through the entirety of the program, and there weren't any problems with that. It, it's more just as a rule of thumb because obviously trying to cater towards different settings, generally speaking, seasons are going to be longer than shorter. So potentially you could move through from phases one to phase four in about twelve weeks or so. Uh, one of the things I would probably just say, I, I didn't mention it in there, but generally phase one or level one here, sorry, is the pre-season level. So ideally, that's the most basic version of the program, and that's designed to be used for the length of pre-season. And then when you move to in-season, you would then move to level two, and then you would move through levels three and four after that accordingly. So yeah, look, you, you could easily move it down to four weeks. Would I move it shorter than that? Probably not. I, I think you're better off being able to give players enough exposure to a certain amount of exercises. Um, I mean, look, I, I don't necessarily know the, the situation in Canada, but I would expect, particularly in the UK in the school season, the seasons are quite short, but the players do get a bit more exposure. They're generally getting around three rugby related exposures a week. So a combination of maybe two training sessions and a match, two matches and a training session, for example. So if it's the same kind of situation in Canada where it's a short season, but there's actually quite a lot of, of exposure in that time, then potentially you could actually shorten the, the length of the window as well. Yeah, very similar. Um, certainly, in in, in uh, certain parts of the country, it is it is very similar to that. Um, so that makes sense. Thank you. Um, we do have a, another clarifying question here. Uh, do you see activation or activate um, uh, as a replacement for a dynamic warm up? Um, if so, how do you ensure athletes are, are properly warmed up without completing activate from start to finish? Sorry, can you just one more time for me? So I missed the second so part of that. Would you see, would you see the act the activate program as a replacement for a dynamic warm up? Um, and if so, uh, how do you ensure that athletes are uh, properly uh, warmed up for a game or a training uh, without completing activation from activate? Sorry, from start to finish. So in fairness, when we first designed activate, it was primarily designed as a warm up, so it could replace. Um, a standard of practice warm up there as well. So it can certainly tick the box in terms of, of being able to warm players up. I'm, I'm just very conscious of not wanting to pigeonhole it just as such, which is why I say moving it to other parts of the training session is an option to explore. Um, look, in fairness, the exercise and the training methods in Activate wouldn't look out of place in a normal warm up anyway. Perhaps the only thing that we don't really do much of is dynamic stretching, but certainly my experience of training in rugby, you generally do quite a little bit of, of body weight resistance work, whether it's the kind of bits and pieces like press ups and squats and lunges so a lot of the exercises are going to carry over anyway which is again coming back to the fact that activate is really it's, it's a package to an extent a lot of the exercises wouldn't look out of place in a number of other settings as well and i guess the only piece that that would be missing are maybe your rugby specific um movements maybe your your pass catch uh, warm up and your uh, uh, those kinds of pieces if you want to you know run any set moves uh, depending on you know, your philosophy with your team and, and coach. I know certain yeah. uh, certain yeah. players and coaches don't want to run training moves uh, or training ground moves the day of a game, uh, but uh, I guess that would be the only piece that would be additional to uh, to activate. Yeah, and, and look, the key thing is it's, it shouldn't be seen as the entirety of the warm-up. If you are going to do it as the warm-up, it should be seen as a part, which is why I say if you're doing it as part of your pre-match, it's generally the first team-based activity that you would do it's not going to be able to prepare them for things like if you're going through set piece run throughs or backs plays, for example, you would go away and do that as well. Um, it, it's just, it should be seen as part of, of the warm up. And I would see it's generally a general preparation. If I was, if I was kind of calling it that, the, the kind of role it plays. Sure. 
Um, one clarification on the adult program um, in part yeah. eight seems to be, you know, game and then exercise. Or is this alternating? So game, exercise, game, exercise, um, or do you, you know, do you do you pull players out and and just uh, swap it once? So it should be alternated. Again, the the adult one was it was interesting because you'll probably find it, it's not a lot different in, in Canada, I expect, where generally the first thing that happens when the players rock up to training is they get a ball out and they go and play a little bit of touch rugby. Um, as players are kind of filtering in, players are coming from work or from home, as the kind of stragglers come in as well. So generally the the session won't start until everyone's there, for example. So it was kind of seen as, as actually we might as well do something about that and say, well, okay, why don't we include some small-sided games in there to start with? Um, and so it doesn't just necessarily form a touch, but it could be anything at the coach's discretion. And then you would alternate between doing that and potentially some of the running based warm up exercises as well. Um, so that was primarily why the, the small sided games are in there. But again, as I've highlighted as well, that, that doesn't mean to say that it has to be that way. There could also be different variations on that. Mm -hmm. Nathan, I saw you grinning there. Uh, is it is it your experience as well that uh, practices that begin with touch sometimes sometimes turn into an hour of, of aimless touch games? Oh. Oh yes, that takes me way back. Yep. <laughs> I think we've all experienced some of that uh, in our. It's, in our it's still it's still alive and kicking. Yeah. <laughs> well, who doesn't want to play touch? In fairness, so. Right now, it'd be great, would. Exactly. <laughs> Honestly, um, a couple more questions here uh, to get through, and then we'll we'll wrap things up. So thanks, folks, for sending okay. these in. Um, Again, a, a clarification on kind of number of sessions per week. So is twice a week really the recommendation uh, to participate in activate exercises? For example, if you're running in uh, programs where you have three or four sessions a week, um, mm. can players complete activate at every session? Um, is that I, I, I guess maybe the um, the general wisdom is that it's not um, it's never too much, but you know maybe players can get. Uh, bored with the uh, with the same exercises over and over hmm. absolutely and, and look I, I like i'd agree entirely that you know there's it's not really too much of a good thing in this sense um what i would say is that if you are doing that then the emphasis is going to be actually on how you vary your delivery of the program so that if you, if you were to do the same exercises in the same way four times a week for a period of time it's it's going to get very very boring very quickly um and so your ability to be able to say, well, OK, well, maybe we'll do it this way this week and then we're going to change it up and do it a little bit differently next week. Um, that's that's probably going to be a better option for you. Now, look, I'm not saying for you need to do it four times a week. Um, what we do know is that generally there is a compliance aspect to this, though, in that the more you do, the better the effects you see. So that that kind of feeds into the whole more is better. But again, that that does have a, a caveat being that more sometimes can be a little bit counterproductive if it's delivered in the same way. Fair enough. Um, we do have a, a comment coming through of front rows hate touch. So fair enough. I do. Uh, <laughs> I have heard that from a few of my uh, uh, front row uh, teammates and colleagues. So in my experience, Although, so when front rows play touch, it, it engages. It becomes semi-contact and then in full on grab <laughs> within a couple of minutes when front rows play touch rugby. So there you go. There yeah. you go. I speak, I speak um, as a member of that union. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Nathan, any comments or questions from you? Uh, the, the one that has come up in the uh, community, especially as we went through um, training Activate with our educators and then some of the delivery was, uh, have you heard of whether or not uh, refereeing has had any, uh, have they been using it as part of their pre-match or weekly training regimen and has there been any kind of results based on that that you've seen? Not yet, no, but it, it's really interesting. Um... Again, when we first designed this, it was it was almost primarily geared towards the players. But since we've been rolling it out, um, particularly in North America, actually, but also in, in other parts of Europe, we're getting a lot of interest from referees in terms of they feel that this is something that they need to start looking at. So can it be used by referees? Absolutely. Have we looked at it yet? Not necessarily. Um, but certainly at the moment, the interest is getting to the stage where I think we're going to have to and, and seeing whether a referee kind of version of Activate as well, or whether or not we need to make any changes to the existing program, or can it just be transplanted from players to referees without any issues at all? So I'd say stay tuned on that. That might well be something that we're, we're gonna to have to go and have a look at very soon. I was gonna say that refs don't really need to prepare for contact, but we all know a referee or two has been bowled over during games. <laughs> All 
All well, right. That was, that, was, that was it from me. But uh, thanks, Mike. And I hope uh, I was able to. I know I know Ashley did a far better job than I did, but we, you know, gave a bit of a demo <laughs> as to what it could look like. No, no, that was great. And thank you very much again. I, I hope it was useful. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think this has been. I think this has been very helpful. We'll be. Uh, this session was recording, so we will be putting it up on the Rugby Canada YouTube page along with uh, all of the uh, previous webinars, uh, and hopefully we'll share this widely so that uh, coaches across the country can access uh, the program and and see some of the modifications and and ways that they can integrate it into our phased return to play. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, appreciate everyone taking the time. Um, thanks, Mike, for taking the time uh, and uh, and for modifying some of this to make it um, uh, to 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 see it in a Canadian context. We'll say, um, and of course, thanks again to our our demonstrators um, as well, Nathan and Ashley. Um, a reminder, everyone, that their uh, that the ban on rugby activities has been lifted, but please check in with your club and provincial union. Um, because there are a, a few checks and balances that we all need to make sure are in place before we get out there and play. Want to make sure everyone is safe um, to do so before getting out onto the field. So I do encourage you to contact your provincial union if you have any questions. Um, all the best to everyone. Uh, we do have another uh, webinar next week. Uh, we'll be announcing that shortly and registration links will be uh, shared on social media and up on the Rugby Canada website. Um, once again, I'll just say a big thank you to Mike. Um, glad to have you here and uh, we'll chat with everyone next week. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Cheers. Have a good evening, everybody.